So our final speaker is uh, Katya Kyrgyeva. Uh, she's from the University of Edinburgh. Um, she's going to talk to us about tunnel fires and small versus ventilation. I know you're probably hungry, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, my presentation is titled Tunnel Fire, Small Versus Ventilation. And let me introduce myself first. I'm Katy Georgieva, and I have an MH in Structural Fire Safety Engineering from the University of Edinburgh, and this is really good for engineer. <laughs> now, I'm doing the postgraduate course at Sheffield Cumming University. More about my dissertation. My dissertation was titled Fires in Ducts, a Comprehensive Overview. Two years ago, when I met with my then future supervisor, he had this idea that uh, research was done in fires in ducts in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And since then, it has been forgotten, and the topic hasn't been researched as much. Uh, and then, people used to research underground mines rather than road or railway tunnels as it is today. But following um, a dozen of major road tunnels in the early 21st century, uh, this research has been started all over again. But now, everything is computerized, so everything was done uh, in a computer model or really complicated programs that we probably only need a year to understand how to work with that program. So my supervisor, oh, whose name I have here, Dr. Ricky Carroll from the University of Edinburgh had the idea of looking into old papers and trying to find some old, not old, but some kind of forgotten physics or chemistry phenomena that are overlooked uh, at the moment. They are deemed too simple or not taken into account when the computer modeling is done for tunnel fires. Um, this involves looking into tons of papers from the 50s and 60s and trying to make out which is the more important information. Um, these are the fires I'm talking about, which kind of given the reward of the research into tunnel fires. Um, I'm going to talk about in detail a bit. I'm going to tell about the Mongwan tunnel fire and the Capron tunnel fire in Austria in 2000. So the Mongwan tunnel is uh, there in Italy and France. And this is the tunnel, uh, which is 12 kilometers long. Uh, on the 24th of March 1999, uh, at uh, 10 a.m., an HGV, which means a very good was traveling from France to Italy. Um, because well, the road is quite steep <coughs> to the tunnel, the engine overheated. Uh, but the driver didn't notice uh, until he was six kilometers into the tunnel, which is kind of pretty much in the middle of the tunnel already. Um, <coughs> Uh, I should probably mention that there were kind of two separate tunnels, one going one direction from France to Italy, and the other one, uh, the other one was going from Italy to France. So by the time he noticed that he informed the tunnel officials, uh, 29 other vehicles, I think eight of them were also HGVs, had entered the tunnel. He couldn't contain the fire with his fire extinguisher, so the tunnel grew really quickly. The 29 vehicles queued behind him behind his AGV and they also caught on fire uh, and that kind of meant there was this huge fire that developed in almost a few minutes but you can see what the consequences were of, those fi uh, of the fire. Um, the problem then was that the ventilation was set to one meters per second and it was blowing from France. It was blowing 
no, excuse me, it was blowing from Italy to France and the vehicles were killed in the French area, meaning that all the smoke spread towards the killed vehicles and where the people were, they couldn't pass. They couldn't pass the fire uh, going to the Italy end and that meant that all of the people in all of the 29 people died as a, most as a result of the smoke they had. And similar they happened in 2000 in Austria and uh, there was this train that traveled every morning from the village of Kaplan there in Austria to the place around there in the mountain with skiers who were to spend their day skiing in the mountain. And in, the, in, uh, in November at 9 a.m., uh, I think it was about 180 people traveling in that train. It's just like one carriage, if you imagine the trains that are used here in Britain for small distances, it's one carriage open. And an uh, electric fan heater caught on fire uh, there in the conductor's cabin. It was one of those uh, fan electric heaters you have at home, for example, you can plug it in. And that was not supposed to be actually used on that train. It wasn't part of the system of the train. Uh, it caught on fire because it was going up. It was at the back of the train. And the conductor at that point was in his cabin at the front. So again, no one noticed until it was already too late. The fire couldn't be put off with uh, a fire extinguisher they had there. And because of the development of the fire, uh, the electricity stopped because some wires melted. The electricity stopped, so the train stopped in the middle of the in the middle of the tunnel there. Also, because of the lack of electricity, the doors didn't open, so pretty much everyone was trapped there in the train. And the tunnel was so inclined that it acted like a huge chimney. The smoke went up to the mountain. So I think only 12 people survived. Uh, they managed to break a window near. Uh, the end train and they started running down from the direction they that the train came from and it was the only way that was why they survived because they went to the opposite direction of where the smoke was coming from actually and pretty much I'm getting to the idea I'm getting to is that when you think of a fire uh, you probably think that people die from birds but smoke is the main reason of the main reason, the main cause of death, and here in this graph, uh, the deaths in, I know, in the UK, I think it's only from fires are presented, and the uh, dark gray, the dark gray bars are the deaths from as a result of burns, and the white ones are as a result of smoke. So pretty much, smoke is as big of a problem for fire safety engineers as is the fire itself, and smoke consists of hot air, which is less dense than normal air. That means that smoke tends to stick to the ceiling because it's less dense, it's uh, lighter. And we as engineers want to make sure that the smoke stays there above height level, which is usually 2.5 meters. We want to give top people a chance as well. So ventilation is used in tunnels pretty much when there is no fire the time anyway when tunnels is used. The ventilation is used to just uh, provide um, fresh air. Um, the longitudinal ventilation, which is the most used because it's the cheaper option as it's in a lot of cases, the cheaper option is the, mo the most used. It means that uh, along the ceiling of the tunnel, uh, there are a few fans, uh, maybe only three or four per tunnel, that provide, um, that can be set to different settings and they provide a stream of fresh air either from one direction or the other. Um, yeah, you can set to one to three meters per second and that will pass what type of what velocity you want to achieve. Um, there is, uh, there are two phenomena really quickly I want to tell you about as a result of ventilation. One of them is stratification, which uh, means pretty much uh, layering of the smoke as a result of the temperature difference. So when, uh, imagine if the ventilation velocity is coming from there, and it's this is the fire and the smoke that's produced uh, gets blown uh, this in this direction. Uh, the, 
smoke is really hot near the fire, so it's again less, um, it's lighter than air, it sticks to the ceiling, but because of the ventilation it gets mixed with the normal air, the contaminated air. Um, that means that downstream of the fire, uh, the smoke is from ceiling to the floor, which is not good for people if they don't work right away. And however, so for certification, you would want a, ideally, you would want a low ventilation so the smoke stays up there. But there is another phenomenon that can occur, which is, uh, we call back layering. And back layering is pretty much the smoke traveling towards the direction from which the ventilation is coming from. And to prevent that, there is this critical ventilation velocity that you have to calculate. For the for the given, I don't remember it now, but uh, it usually ends up being about three meters per second. So ideally, when there is a fire and in a tunnel, you kind of have two ways to go, either one way or the other. So you would want one of those ways to be free of smoke, so the people have a safe egress route to a runway. And ideally, you would want to prevent this back layering. So the problem that comes from that is. You want to prevent stratification, you want to prevent back layering, but to prevent stratification you need a low ventilation velocity to prevent that, you need a higher one. And thus the problem occurs that I also didn't mention maybe when there is a higher ventilation velocity, apart from stratification that occurs downstream there the fire gets bigger in size because of, well, when you have a fireplace and you want to make the fire bigger, you just start blowing a piece of cardboard. So it makes the fire bigger, that meaning that it even produces more smoke. And that leads us to the problem, which is we want higher ventilation velocity to prevent back layering. This, in terms, means that the fire growth rate increases, producing more smoke. So you would need even a higher ventilation velocity to prevent that smoke from back layering and that's kind of a vision <coughs> still uh, hasn't been solved, but pretty much the engineers use three meters per second and this would manage to prevent the back layering. This would manage to prevent the back layering by some point, I mean maybe 10, 15 minutes different for different sizes of tunnels and you just kind of have to hope that people are already safe uh, away from the fire by that point. You, I mean that you can't prevent back layering forever. By some point it will start to occur, but you just have to take the chances. And that's it. That's what I wanted to talk about. We'll, we'll now take some questions. Uh, can you use that uh, analysis to predict sort of which way evacuation rules should be in case of the fire? Yes, uh, that's that's the point because tunnels have uh, evacuation. They have uh, fire exits at different distances. I don't know; it's different for tunnels. Maybe let's say two kilometers. And when you detect the fire, the the tunnel officials or whoever is controlling the ventilation, they can set it to blow either one way or the other. So signs, uh, uh, illuminated signs would uh, point to the arrow, would point uh, an arrow to the way people have to run. So they would know, they would calculate which is the closer exit and they would try to blow the, blow the smoke to the exit that's further. That well, wouldn't people running sort of interfere with that flow? What do you mean? People would, wouldn't... Well, if you have quite many people running, they kind of create like uh, more friction for the air flow to blow. Um, so wouldn't that... No, actually, when you think about it, three meters per second is really high, so people running wouldn't... Yes, the, there are two types of ventilation actually. Uh, I did 
didn't tell about the transverse ventilation, which uh, is um, consisted of many, many fans along the way of the tunnel, of the ceiling, if you imagine it. And there are fans that provide air and extract air, but that is really, really expensive, so no one will complain about that. So the longitudinal ventilation that is used is just some fans, which are three, four, five for the whole tunnel. And yes, they are set to a certain speed and they go. Yeah. 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 if you have an emergency system that just turns off the ventilation if you detect fire. Obviously, you know, as you said, ventilation is a tricky uh, thing you have during a, uh, during a fire situation. Uh -huh. So I'm just wondering what happens if you actually turn off the ventilation. Obviously, go for then become... If you turn off the ventilation, yeah. this is what's going to happen. Smoke is going to go everywhere and it's probably going to be from ceiling to the floor. And from ceiling to the floor? Yes. yes. All right, because my, I mean, I don't, I don't understand it quite well, but uh, as you said, you will still have some uh, clean air on the, towards the bottom. For how long would that be? Because you also I'm said that you sure, need to but that's not feasible. I guess it wouldn't be for long enough. People would have to crawl. Oh. Any other questions? Um, yeah. I, guess, I guess my question is, um, it's more about, it's more of a theoretical question, I guess, but since, since, you, since you're filling that whole tunnel with smoke the moment there's a fire, could you not have, you know, a pipeline which is just... Uh, extracting the smoke? Which just extracts smoke. That's what the transverse ventilation, that's not so common, uses. The transverse ventilation extracts the smoke, okay. and the longitudinal just blows it to mind. So eventually this smoke that's blown would come come out of one of the tunnel. In, okay. in reality it wouldn't get sucked. Or you get wouldn't get extracted by a okay. system, it would just go away from mind. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, well thank you very much.